I'd like to welcome you all. I'm Damian Wetzel. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Arts Programs, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, I think this is one of the more voluble audiences that we've had in this room for the sessions that I've been doing, and I think that's only fitting uh, that we have uh, such enthusiasm vocally uh, in this room as we welcome uh, Francesco Zambello for this roundtable discussion. Francesca, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, a fair number of you know exactly uh, who Francesca is and, and why she would be the exact right person to have this discussion about opera in the contemporary world uh, with us here at the Aspen Institute. Uh, there is an extensive biography here which you can go through, but allow me to say that in, in my estimation as a, as a dancer and dance director and choreographer and all the, all the things that go along from that world, looking at your biography, Francesca, is, uh, is nothing but range. You just, you know, I look at you and I think range. Uh, is that a constant theme from your childhood, from the beginning? Uh, uh, range has always been something I have been in pursuit of. I think that, uh, well, it, like dance, you know, you, you can't just do one thing in the arts. I mean, the arts is about being able to wear as many hats as possible, and that's what the Renaissance taught us, and we should keep going forward with that. That's interesting. Do you think that that is uh, in, an increasing quantity as in terms of the artists of today, uh, that that's ever more necessary to be versatile? Yes. I mean, I think, uh, of course, you know, there are also great specialists in many things, but I think that particularly uh, for a director, uh, you know, that is basically an interpretive art form. I, I am not, I'm not the person who writes it. I'm not the person who painted it. I'm not the initial creator. A director is in many ways an interpreter. And we can't do what we do like a choreographer without a lot of other people. So I think that being able to be open and fluid, and for me that meant from opera to theater to musicals to uh, creating new works to shows for children to whatever. Uh, have story, will direct. That's my <laughs> motto. That's fantastic. Let's talk for a moment about you know the the path. Uh, I understand that your parents were both in theater before your father uh, embarked on a more uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I'm actually very happy to say that my mother, I think, is live streaming this because I just saw huh? they were doing that. So my mother is in Los Angeles. She is 92. She is an actress, um, very uh, busy on her computer. So I hope she's watching it. She's an actress. Uh, she's still working to some degree. She was most recently the librarian on Glee. Uh, and my father started as an actor and then became a businessman. So I was fortunate that the arts were an integral part of my childhood. And, um, a and I was raised around them and with a love for them. But you weren't out there hoofing around as a child, no, I was, like sleeping I, on the theater case no, at night? And no, I was definitely around the theaters a lot. Uh, backstage and I think that's where directing came from is from being backstage so much and seeing what how wh how it all goes together more than the performing aspect interesting and that and that was apparent to you even at that young, at a young young age that you I, thought, I, think I, wanna, I, I don't want to go out there right. I want to tell them where to well, go out there. I, I mean interesting that I have a, a, a young friend who I who I grew up with um, who who told me recently how I used to tell everybody what to do when we were six. So I, clearly directing was in there. And, I, and I'm very honored to say that my college roommate, Peggy Clark, is here on my left, who is, uh, works at the Aspen Institute and does a lot of very, very important things in the world. Um, you know, when I, she talks about, you know, saving children and women and population in India, I think, what am I doing? Um, but uh, so uh, theater was all through college, and, and it really was something that was a lifeblood for me. Interesting, and and as you said, even at a young age, telling people where to go and you know how to, how to put it together. Right. Well, I think it was I was like inventing stories. I loved to make up stories. I loved, like a lot of people, uh, puppets, marionettes, writing the script, making the costumes, doing uh -huh. uh, d doing all of that. Whatever it took, whatever the story Whatever required. it took, and then yeah. uh, I really, by my teens, I was working in theaters in the summer, summer theaters, as an intern, a gopher. Uh, getting the coffee, and I, 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 truthfully, I think th this profession is a profession that comes <laughs> from being around people who do it, I in the sense of, of guilds mm -hmm. and, and a, a traditional sense. I think that's what makes a theater artist uh, for, for what I do. And so 
You started, it seems, more in the theater world and then gravitated to the opera world through a series of, of events that occurred. But does that mean that, uh, how did you train to, let's say, coach an opera singer? Or d does that not for you? Well, I, mean, I, I, I think, I, I mean, coaching an opera singer is, is different than actually what I do. Coaching right. an opera singer, when we, we use that word, that's more about someone who plays the piano and mm -hmm. teaches them the notes and the words. Right. I come in at the next step when they know the notes and the words and I help them figure out the character, how to interpret the character, and then in the bigger picture how to uh, be part of a story and create a role. Um, so a, a director's job is in, again, in a way, you're the person who comes along once a lot of the pieces have already started, but mm -hmm. you put it all together. How about, how does that relate to directing, let's say, in the theater, in musical theater? Uh, directing in all forms is, whether it's film or TV or whatever, it, there are many similarities, but there are also many things that are, that are very, very different. I mean, for me, as I jokingly said before, it is, number one, the story. It's understanding what is the story and how can characters help you tell that story. So whether that's something that's f just caught for a moment on film or whether that's something that's on the stage, that I is all part of it. But the process, you know, working with an opera singer is very, very different, honestly, than working with an actor. I mean, yeah. I used to sort of gloss over this, but now I'll just tell the truth. Um, I mean, opera singers, by, uh, because of what they do, they are closer to athletes. They have to have this incredible physical training of singing, uh, and they come to rehearsal the first day knowing the part. They've got it memorized. Whereas an actor comes in, and they, they're like an open canvas. They don't know the script. They don't know the music. If it's a musical, you learn it together. And it's that part of the process that often with opera singers can be frustrating because you want them to unlearn what they know and learn it again so that because discovery is, is what makes good theater. I mean, theater, you want to feel like the performer is discovering it while you're discovering it as an audience member. And so that's kind of a, a basic technical difference between the two. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was actually trying to get at, sort of. Well, I told a, the truth now. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. It's okay. just that, you know, the parallel in the, in the ballet world is not, you can't make it exactly because, you know, there are directors of, let's say, classical productions who right. aren't necessarily the choreographer. You know, right. It's possible, but but generally, uh, the way it would it would translate would be, let's say, a classical production where there's acknowledged choreography that everybody yes, has learned. Yes, I mean learned, everybody knows and this you is come you in know. And you say, well, I feel I feel like it needs to flow this way, right. and then that doesn't fit with my arabesque. Right. Exactly. And, and yeah, you know, it's it's so very similar. That doesn't fit with the, how I do it. You know, I need to <laughs> kneel here. I don't. This I mean, those days those days are kind of gone. Mm -hmm. I have to say, of opera singers. I mean, where the the I do it this way. I mean, when I first started directing, there was a lot of I do it this way. And I was like, no, 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 no. We do it together a new way. Mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, and not changing their vocalization? Uh, no, I mean, I th no, not. And I think it's more, again, it's about interpretation. It's about what a character is doing and thinking and how they look and how they move and how they, how they sing something. I mean, yes, we do work often when the best relationships are when you're with a great conductor who really is collaborating with you, who's shaping the phrase with you as you're shaping it dramatically. You say like, I think that the character is, is much angrier here than, than, but, and the music is doing a, you know, a forte and then a sudden stop or something. So the conductor, a great conductor can work with you in making the music really help you dramatically. The same way a good conductor, a good conductor can help a production or they can kill a production. Yeah, the same way they can do that, that with a dancer. A, it's a battle. Uh, I read the director versus uh, conductor, fast versus slow. Often. Yeah, I, I mean, dir the directors and conductors. You, it's it's weird because in a, in a play or a musical, one person is the captain of the boat, the director, and the musical director does what you tell them. Um, and I like, of course, I like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in an opera, you must collaborate with the conductor. They are your partner, and, and so you're, you have this back and forth. And, and of course, all, having that relationship with someone d does often lead to better things. You know, conflict does make things better in art. It just does. You know, not everybody can. Uh, that's why I'm against the dictator view of directing. I mean, I do think it's important to have dialogue and, and listen to everyone, and ultimately I'll decide. But still, it's that process. And a, and a great conductor can really make it.
We're going to project until you're ready. Okay. A, a truly great conductor will make you hear music like you've never heard it before, as will a great singer. You know, if you're an opera fan, you know, everybody's heard La Boheme 50 times. And it, it, can, it can be boring. Uh, b unless you have people who bring some nuance and something special to it. And that's what a conductor and a director try to bring out of something. And also, often, quite frankly, it's our job, there's a lot of repertory that's not great that you have to help make better. Yeah, uh, you know, they're boring, they're boring parts of Giselle. I mean, uh, Lots. Lots, <laughs> right. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, uh, so, the, no, so you yeah. really have to, I mean, they're boring parts and of the ring. That's a short one. Right, um. yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so, right. So you really have, have got to have that collaborator in hand with you. Yeah, I love the idea that the conflict breeds that that uh, that enhanced resolution, and well, it's, uh, it, it comes out of that. I mean, that's what I mean. Theater is a collaborative art form. It is not. I mean, that's why I respect so much people who are painters, or sculptors, or writers, or composers because they are working alone. They they are alone. Mm -hmm. They're usually they're in a box. You know, it's like they're pouring it onto the page wherever that page is. Whereas we go to work, and there's so many people there. I mean, in a rehearsal, you know, you have all the performers and you have your staff and often you have all the designers who you've worked with who are helping you create the visual world and sometimes the chorus. So, so we're creating through people. And so it, it, it's a very, very different, it's process. And the, theater is collaborative. You have to have dialogue with it. For me, I work best by having dialogue with everyone and working with everyone and talking about everything. Everything comes from talking. Everything comes from talking and discussing and improvising and inventing and uh, whether it's the designers who you work with who are figuring out what do people wear, what do they look like, or how is the set going to be, uh, you know, is it set in a period, is it an abstract location, is it a realistic location, uh, and what is the story we're going to tell, you know, is the marriage of Figaro just a, a drama about a, a middle-aged couple who are having problems, or is it a social drama, a political drama? I mean, that's... Uh, or, an, or what an, can it be? Uh, and what can it be? And those yeah. are the questions that you have to ask yourself every time, and that's why something like opera, which I honestly think has to constantly be being reinvented in some way, you have to have new interpretations. You have to have different ways of presenting it to an audience. We evolve as a civilization, and there's no reason that the great works of art that our performance works should not keep evolving with us. And that's, I think that's why they're enduring works of art. I mean, a, a masterpiece to me means that it is always contemporary. And that's what makes, to me, that's what makes theater. That's why we keep doing some of the works that we keep doing and others, that was it for that one. Is there a, is there a significant tension in the opera world about that point, about contemporizing? Oh, things? yeah. I mean, you know, the, and, and that's good. I think opera people, audiences now, uh, are extremely vocal. They love being vocal. It's a vocal art form, right? Uh, and so people complain about it, and yet they love it. And, and I mean, there's a very wide-ranging opinion on the reinterpreting of the classics. The same, actually, unlike, I think, dance or, you know, we don't have a problem with Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake. No. Uh, we don't have a problem, you know, starting really with in the 1970s when Peter Brook re-envisaged um, Midsummer Night's Dream, which we consider sort of the turning point in modern theater of interpretive modern theater. Uh, we don't think that's a problem in theater. But in opera, for some reason, and I think it's because it's a 19th century art form, it really hasn't evolved past that. We don't have the composed, you know, we don't have Wagner, Verdi, Rossini, Puccini, in the 20th century. We don't have that level of popularity among operatic composers. We have them among George Gershwin, Rodgers and Hart, uh, Jerome Kern. So that's where I think the tension really goes back to the material. I will say that the, the passions that are, evol uh, uh, that are evident at, at the opera or at, at times at the symphony, I've, for instance, I've never seen a fist fight at the ballet. Over the content, I but have I, seen them. In, I have seen, seen them at the, in the opera, opera, and I've seen it at Carnegie Hall. I have experienced it firsthand at the <laughs> opera. Um, my debut at the Met was uh, in like 1993. I directed Lucia. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a controversy extraordinaire. There was screaming. 
and booing and cheering, and there were fist fights. Um, because I told the story that basically this is a girl who's sold off like chattel by her brother and is driven crazy by him. Joe must have been thrilled. Joe sure. Volpe, he, it was, it was, it was tough exciting, on him. Right? Yeah, it was tough on oh, him. But, but that was kind exciting. of the beginning of that, of that treatment of, let's say, of more updating or more rethinking of operas at the Met. That was really a sort of a door opening. So, yes, I've experienced firsthand. And in Europe, we see it constantly. We don't see it in as much in America because people are, they're politer or they think they don't know. And I think it's my job to make sure that everybody should feel like they do know. I want to know your opinion. We, we all want to know what you think. So you have, so the audience should have a piece of it, basically. Oh. Yeah. And why it's don't a, they, It's a think? communal experience. I mean, theater does not exist without the audience. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that when the audience is silent, the, the Greeks taught us that the audience, the audience spoke back during performances then. Um, and, and, and I think that, I don't necessarily encourage that now, but I, I do think that, you know, that, that the audience, we can't live without the audience. And that's why, to me, uh, I'm a practitioner of live theater. I don't work in media. I don't, it's not that I don't believe in it, it's just that's not my calling. My calling is the audience, is the direct connection, and whether we have that excitement, that cyclical energy or not. Uh, and I'm sure as a performer, you felt that. I mean, you, 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 you've been an audience member. You go out and you go, my God, that was such an amazing performance. What was it? And it's the fact that you had an energy that went to the stage, that went back to you, and, and it, 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 it exponentially becomes greater. Talk a little more, if you would, about that moment, because I've, I've heard you describe that, that that being the point of it all. Is that well, live moment as opposed mm -hmm. to what, you know, we can watch over and over again, which has a different right. value? I mean, I, I think that the live moment, I think, is something that, uh, that I hope that that's a reason that people will continue to engage in live, whether it's theater or opera, ballet, whatever it is. And as we all know, those numbers are diminishing, but we are seeing an uptick now. And, and I do think it's the anti the anti-techno trend, um, where live does have a, uh, a feedback. And for me, it's a drug. That's why I keep going back, is trying to find, is there that moment where we can all celebrate that together or not? And that's what it is for you, a communal moment, people coming together I think it's a communal, I think it's totally a communal moment. I don't think you experience it, now it's going to be heresy, somewhat, I'm going to say. I don't think you experience it when you go to an HD simulcast from the Met. I don't think you experience that in the cinema. Uh, y yes, it's a great experience, but it's not what live is. It's just not. And, and that's what uh, technology has changed what is art, as we know, has w art as in performing arts right now. Because um, everyone can get it on demand at home. And they're not sitting in that Greek communal place of the audience and the stage and the performers wrapped together in something that they are supposed to experience, whether it's entertainment or, or, or something to make you think deeper. I think, that's, I think that you're, what you're talking about really is that the technology is a great extender. It can get to places that it couldn't ordinarily get to, and I think in, uh, it, it, that can go in a number of ways in performance, but also maybe in education. You know, you can absolutely spread, but it doesn't actually substitute. Uh, well, we for haven't that, that spark. Right. Well, we haven't found yet what is the way to use technology to make live be live at home or live. We do, we don't have that yet. We don't know what that is. We don't know if it's something technological that's going to come in the next decade. We don't know when Google makes the glasses that everything's going to be in the glasses. That you know, We just don't know yet. The same way that we didn't know 10 years ago even what we know so far. So, so, I, so I think that, I think technology is, we're just in its infantile stages really. Yes. Let, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about some of the work you're doing. Uh, so you've been the director at Glimmer Glass for a few years now. No, just, two? just under two years, just yes. Under two. And the first thing you did is change it from the Glimmer Glass opera, opera to Glimmer Glass Festival, I changed the name right? of it to the, the Colbert Glimmer. would say, what do you have against opera? Right. Um. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I have nothing against opera, but my, just for those who don't know, Glimmer Glass Festival is located in upstate New York in a rural community, in a farm community, uh, an impoverished county, one of the poorest in upstate New York, Otsego County. Uh, and I took it on because it's basically an educational situation. A quarter of our budget goes to education. We have 100 interns there every year. We 
present after the Metropolitan Opera the most number of opera performances in the state of New York. Actually, the most number of opera performances in New England, all the way down here to the Washington National Opera. Um, and I w wanted to do that job because I wanted to reach wider audiences, new audiences, children, and so that is what I have worked on there. And the word opera, it just it turns off a lot of people. I mean, let's be honest. I know a lot of people in this room love opera, so do I. But I wanted to present a wider programming. I added a classic American musical with no amplification, just real voice, the way that composers first wrote them. Many, many concerts, lectures, more of a total experience, collaboration with local museums, collaboration with a local brewery to make a beer for us, anything to get people in there, working with farmers so that farmers would come, offering performances at times that they could come, uh, offering discounts for children, all kids $10, so that we had uh, a 450 percent increase in children's attendance, just anything to get people to come to the live experience uh -huh. so that they would have that. So taking the word opera out was was a marketing, totally marketing. It's and about then creating also an opportunity and, right. for more engagement and saying we, yes. can, we can engage making, more without it. I mean, I know it sounds so boring. We all say, let's make the arts more accessible. But, you know, you have, and not dumb it down. We, I think, got people there, are getting people there, because they are experiencing it in a different way, making it in a thing where we're fortunate we're on a beautiful location. Uh, you can picnic there, you can swim in the lake, and then come see an opera. I encourage people to come in their bathing suits, come in your kayak, whatever, come on your tractor, I don't care. Um, and they do, and they do, and they do, and they do, and they do. The other day we had a traffic jam in front of the theater because cows were all, had all decided to stop there. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that it, it's important that people know that live performances can be for anyone and everyone, that families can come. Um, I, I'm, you know, working with local schools, you know, we've had a, not just an uptick in kids coming to the shows, but also I've tried to put more kids in the shows. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of operatic repertory that has children in it, a lot of musicals that have children in it. And so it's that whole thing of if people see it, if they see themselves on stage, they buy tickets. You know, I, you don't have to, when marketing has taught us that, you don't have to be brain surgeons to know that, you know, Asians will buy tickets, they see Asians on stage. We're all like, oh, okay, you know, let's put people of color on the stage and we'll get people of color in the audience. Not without working to make it all, you know, accessible and that it's like there for everyone. People are still afraid to come in buildings. I, with all respect to the Kennedy Center, you know, it's a very imposing building. Before Lincoln Center, it's imposing. Uh, and we have to make these big temples less... Less well, uninviting. I think you have a tremendous understanding of the, you know, how to avoid boundaries. So, I mean, it's a perfect mm -hmm. example of that, what, what you're describing. I would say, I, I'd be curious to know what you think actually about the education efforts you're doing. Um, a lot of the work that we're focusing on in the Arts Program at the Aspen Institute mm -hmm. and what I do myself has to do with getting art back into schools in, in significant and interesting ways, taking mm -hmm. advantage of technology in some cases just simply because of the, the possibilities, yeah. but also about just performance and, and teaching kids what it means, which I was interested about what you said. I think, I, I, I think first of all, technology, the best thing about technology, I think, is education. I think the Kennedy Center is doing it better than anybody else in America right now, and they're probably spending the most money, but they're going to get the most for it. We all know, I mean, the NEA told us last year that if people were involved in the arts up until the age of 16, then when they're an adult, they will, there is a 50 percent chance that they will give money or go to something. So we, so we have to get, so on my little scale, it's about making tickets affordable, so go out and get a grant. People want to help kids. Making, putting kids on the stage, and then also this training program I mentioned. As, as I said, we have 100 interns. So those are people in their early 20s. They're young singers, every aspect of production, administration. It's a, a full-scale training program. But, but it's also making people realize, I think, that, that art means you should be paid. We pay everybody who works for us. We pay nine-year-old kids who come work for this, we pay them a fee, we, we pay their gas, we, and, and I think that that's part of it, is equating art with, a, that it fits into our whole financial world. I mean, also just, as a footnote, I also believe that arts should run a lot more like businesses. I mean, last year I said, spend more money and we'll make more money, and we did. We raised our budget 
by 15 percent, and we had a, a, a we we raised a lot more money, and we sold a lot more tickets, and we put on a lot more shows. So I'm not veering from the kid question, no, but but, but it's that all did relevant. but that did allow us to have more programming for kids. Um, and then again, there's the whole question of what is programming for kids. Ugh. You know, a lot of programming for kids is terrible. You wouldn't. Well, it's just that's, that was the, my my follow up to that was. Uh, when you were growing up and in school, and I know you were in school here and then also in Europe, right? But what was arts education to you? Well, I think I mean, every, I don't see anybody in like this room. How many people are under 30 in this room? Only a few. Um, we used to have, remember we used to have arts in the schools? Remember teachers used to, what there was, it? What? what was it? What, there, what was it? It was great. It was, remember we had choral <laughs> class and art class and, uh, drama and everything after school, and we don't have those things. So, you know, I'm 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 looking very much this direction right over here of my colleague Randy Weingarten, who uh, who is helping us get those things back in schools and helping us recognize the value of those teachers. Um, uh, and we cannot do enough for them. I mean, I I I think that 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 the place to start is education, and the place to put money behind is education, and that's actually honestly pretty cheap. You know, a little bit of money towards education goes a long, long way in the long term. I mean, in terms of, you know, whether it's, you know, performance assistance or getting people there or busing or, you know, we don't do, at Glimmerglass, we don't do going into the schools because we're a summer festival. We're not performing during the year. But we do everything we can to get all, to work with all the local schools to get their kids who, these kids, they're not going to summer camp. They're not going to some expensive camp. So we do everything to get them there, and also actually we do a lot to hire them. We hire about, aside from the 100 interns, we hire about 100 kids who are in high school to do all of our parking and all of our grounds work, and then we give them free tickets as well. So we pay them and we give them tickets. And the, just this having done that last year, we are, I got a bunch of emails this year, was like, I went to see the school opera or the school play because I saw one last year. I mean, so again, it, it's slow seeds, seeds, but it's planting so. seeds. I think that in as much as it's uh, maybe a natural segue, a summer festival as opposed to many of the other institutions that you work with, whether it's the Met or you know, the, the National here right. or you, know, you name it, the opportunities for arts organizations to partake in this are, are ever more relevant, don't you think? I think a, a summer festival, summers are easier, there's no question. Summer festivals are easier. I mean, I'm learning the challenges. Uh, I want to introduce my colleague, Michael Mayle, who, who is from the Washington National Opera, the executive director. Uh, it, it, the challenges are, are, are much harder in a year-round company. And I think now all of us in opera who are in year-round companies are facing huge, you know, huge walls. And a lot of them are, how can we survive? What can we survive with? How do we make ourselves relevant to today? You know, is HD hurting us? Uh, these are big questions that we have to face. Whereas a summer festival is definitely easier. You can, <laughs> you can change programming at a summer festival in two minutes um, like that, which you can't do that often in these big institutions. Do you want to talk a little bit about the National Opera here in your? I have to say, I, I have to say, I'm, I, I, I want to wait a little. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly think, just in, in brief, that I'm very excited that we have a couple initial. Well, maybe I will say a few things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now that you mentioned it, um, there are several things that we've worked hard on in terms of new initiatives for the next few years that are addressing, I think. You know, what is the future of opera? What does it mean to have national in your title? Um, yet you're in Washington. What does that really mean? And so to that end, what we have tried to do is several things of the following. First of all, institute more family, family programming. We're adding every year a holiday performance that will be either a standard work or new works, which the new works I'll get to in a minute. Um, We've started a big New Works initiative, uh, and I think that, that New Works are, are definitely, for me, it's a personal love, um, but also New Works that speak in a different way. We're doing a kind of three-tiered program, which is a younger tier engaging young composers, people just out of conservatory, to write short operas, like 20-minute operas. How much would you love to go see a 20-minute opera instead of four and a half hours? A people who are 20 would like to do that. They would like to, they could tweet it, it's short, 
So we are commissioning young composers through very, you laugh, but it's true. All right, it's like, how many of you would rather go to the opera at four in the afternoon? Who wants to wait around till eight at night? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, you do. Absolutely. All right. So young composers, then com commissioning composers who are writing one hour pieces. We're about to announce some commissions that are one hour long that are geared around American topics. I think it's important to write stories about American stories, American myths, American people, whatever, not, not based on a movie, not based on a 19th century European novel. And then last, we will be commissioning big works, you know, big new works. But the main thing is with this, with the first two tiers, the young composers and the short, the one hour, what I'm sort of thinking of them as cocktail operas, um, it allows us to get a lot of new repertory out there, a lot of stuff to just talk about. You know, talk is what is what makes it happen. And we can address, in a short opera, you can write about, you know, you know, Nancy Pelosi. You can write about something that is contemporary that's happening now. Opera used to be a contemporary art form. When Verdi wrote and Mozart wrote, they were writing about political problems in their society. Uh, and so there's no reason that I think that we can't go back to making that kind of music reach out. So that is another one of our big initiatives. And then our, our production planning for the next few years includes doing more new productions, which means productions where we're bringing in, I think, insightful and interesting directors, different viewpoints. Um, and then we have announced that in three years, we, we, we began the ring cycle a few years ago and then stopped it, and we will be completing it and doing several big, several cycles of it, which will draw a lot of focus to Washington, D.C., because it won't just be about the ring, it will be a complete engagement with the center. So those are kind of big projects that are happening that are part of what we're doing in Washington. And watch this station as more <laughs> unfolds. You had nothing to say about that. I that know. I, so I saw that. Well, I don't know how. Uh, a lot of that, that's been announced. So I just thought it's good to rub yeah. it in some more. That's fantastic. And what about the plans for Rebecca? Where oh, Rebecca. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's a musical that I developed in, in, in Austria based on the uh, Daphne du Maurier, which has been running in Vienna for a number of years and is running in Germany and in Switzerland. And there are plans to bring it to Broadway this fall. That's fantastic. So that's, and that's on? We're, yes. we're looking forward to well, that. Well, as on as anything is on. You got a theater? <laughs> yeah, we have theater. You got a theater? Yes. Then it's yes. on. Yeah. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, I think that um, we normally open up for questions around now. So I just encourage people, if they have any, to raise your hand and we'll call. And to use your mics, you press the button. When it's red, it is on. And then when you finish, press it so that it is off. All right. We start with uh, Joanne. Joanne, yeah. I just applaud you for your, your inspiration about your initiatives. Uh, I think one of the early, I'm sorry if I'm not talking. Hi, I just applaud you, Francesca. It's incredible. So that idea of immersion, is, is, uh, is that something you think about for young artists going up? Like they yeah. Should? I mean, I think, uh, I mean, at, at Glimmer Glass, in a way it's easier in a summer situation to immerse people where they can't escape, they can't go anywhere else. And I mean, actually, actually um, <laughs> this summer up there, I mean, I don't know how much we're supposed to talk about, like up there versus down here, but um, up there, I, 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 I've tried to make the entire season about social change and issues that are issues of today. Um, thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Here we go. Keep trying this. Um, I've tried to do a whole season where every show that we're doing relates to some social topic, some political topic, and have engaged speakers as well. Uh, so, for example, we're doing Aida, which I'm sorry if you don't know opera, then I'll just briefly, you know, it's, it's an opera that's set in Egypt uh, during the time of the pharaohs, but we have updated it to today, so, and it's about a civil war, so obviously that's about what's going on in Egypt right now, so I have speakers coming to talk about Arab Spring. I am working with the Muslim community in Utica, which is a, the nearest city, uh, in quotes, um, and uh, to come and speak about it. Um, we're doing a piece, Lost in the Stars, that's about South Africa, and I brought singers from South Africa, from the Cape Town Opera, and I have uh, uh, you know, speakers about apartheid. Um, I have to say I'm very happy that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is coming to speak this summer on trials in opera. There are a lot of operas that have trials. You know, Aida and Lost in the Stars, for example. I mean, the ring cycle is basically starts with a crummy lawyer. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a, so, so, right, so I've tried to do that. Um, uh, so, uh, so, but I mean, I think we talk about young people, so I feel like immersing all these kids in these kind of things. Uh, we're doing a Baroque opera, Armide, which is about a Muslim princess and a Christian knight. So I am working with local religious leaders. Uh, so in a way, having a hundred young kids on campus every day, they're gonna learn a lot about tolerance and politics that maybe they don't think about all the time. And l hopefully the audience will as well. I think that that's, uh, I'm so glad you brought that, that point in because to me, one of the most meaningful ways that the arts can contribute beyond simply creativity and giving you know, inspiration is actually connecting the dots on many things through the work. And the way you refer to the composers addressing the, the, the political issues of the time and what you're doing you know, in fleshing that out from the opera and from the musical theater to the policy is incredibly valuable and it's very much what um, the Aspen Institute represents. So I think that that's, uh, I should tell you that next year our whole program has a theme of citizen artists. And you are, my God, a citizen artist. I'm yes. trying, I'm trying. You are. Other questions? Please. Mr. Brown. You just came from uh, Sydney. I don't need a mic, obviously. So you just came from Sydney where you did this outdoor production of La Traviata that became uh, a huge event and created more audience for Opera Australia than anything in history. And you said earlier that opera is an 18th, a 19th century art form, and that's one of the ways you keep from having a 19th century audience. What lessons do you take from your experience there for the Kennedy Center and also for Glitterbus? I think that the, just Don is referring to, I just did a, a performance of La Traviata outside on Sydney Harbor where we built a stage with the bridge and the opera house in the background and sold about a, a hundred thousand tickets to audiences over a month who came and at reduced prices. Um, so I think with the Kennedy Center we are doing certain outreaches. We have something called uh, opera in the outfield uh, which is very important that we take one opera and do a simulcast in the ballpark here. Uh, but I do think interestingly this notion of big scale operas which you see often abroad in Europe there are a number of places and of course the, all the great arenas did it. Uh, it is something that I think is worth exploring. I mean, I would love to do Aida in Yankee Stadium. Um, I think that those kind of situations definitely are possible. And I think that that spectator sport is definitely part of the ethos of opera and should be encouraged. I mean, I mean it's not always the best thing. And in the 19th century, Wagner made the lights go down in the audience. Up until Wagner's time, the lights were on in the audience. And that's why opera and theater was, and dance was much more of a spectator sport. Interestingly, the 19th century changed that. And, and so I think that getting back to that would be a really good thing, personally. I mean, I'm all for like, bring your food, picnic, whatever. I mean, I, I think you have to respect it to some degree. I mean, it's a temple, it's a theater. But I also think that that sense of it's yours can be encouraged through various kinds of performances. And also probably to, to, re, to reimagine what a traviata can be. To think to yourself, I mean, uh, what, I, I do this in, in dance, I run a, a summer festival out in Vail, and you see Balanchine Serenade outside with the mountains as opposed to, you know, at the New York State Theater, it's a completely different thing, even for the people dancing it for that matter. Well this was, I mean, we definitely did some things that were, I would say, 
audience getting where we had fireworks during the Brindisi of Violetta's party and we had Violetta riding on a five ton chandelier on a crane over the harbor. Uh, guests arriving by water taxis, but people loved it. So, and it did, it, it made that thing of just people even saying the word opera, you know, it, it, it raises consciousness about it as something that is, again, entertainment for everyone. Opera me in Latin means work. It doesn't mean anything but that. And, and so I think that's, 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 that's a wonderful aspect of what it is. It is something that, not the work to go to, but it's something that, is, that you can enjoy and do for all. Uh, Fernando? Playing yesterday, and um, picked up this complimentary magazine, and the whole magazine was about festivals. And I opened the middle page, and it was about learning how to crowd surf, which means your body goes through the crowd and how to do it safely. But the other Sounds the thing that intrigued me were how many festivals there are and the budgets for these music festivals. They're in multi-million dollar budgets, and they go for two weeks to six weeks, and. Uh, what I was, one listening to you, I was thinking, well, you know, opera, I'm lucky because my mother sent me to Austria when I was a young kid, and I'm, I'm an addict. I love classical opera. But now you have to compete with super sensory uh, commercial events and commercial types of music and theater, in some cases theater, but not that much, you know. Um, the Cirque du Soleil, I'll, I'll put in that classification, but it's stuff that, like you were saying, technology has developed to such an extent that these things intrigue young people. And I think basically we're talking about young people because the young people are the ones that, for the most part, lead the contemporary charge on all the arts. Right. I, I, mean, I mean, I think you're asking a couple different questions. I mean, first of all, the young people. I, I think, yes, we all want young audiences, but also there are huge audiences of people who are, people live longer. People have more money. You know, I'm all for let me get more people who are 55 to the theater who never could go when they were 40 because they didn't have time or money. So I want to work on young audiences, but I also work very hard on what I call my peer audience because they're people who have time to do things. In terms of music festivals, I just do want to say, yes, ev every theater, I think, particularly, you know, Washington might be more expensive, or the Met is certainly the highest ticket price. But our little festival, I just would like it said that we operate on a budget of $6.3 million. We do 45 performances in the main stage, 25 concerts, and about 20 lectures. And I was very happy today the Wall Street Journal complimented us because our earned income ratio was 45% earned income, 55% unearned income. And it was comparing us to City Opera where the earned income was 8%. So. I agree with you. You know, we've got to find ways to make it more accessible financially and by, I think, using business practices and making it more feasible economically. So uh, big, and then I just want to say one thing when you talk about the young and, and big uh, technology. I think, how many people shop organic or go to Whole Foods or buy from a farmer's market? Okay, everybody in this room. That process to me is analogous to hearing something live. There will always be an audience, and maybe it will get bigger, who do not want to buy processed food, but who want to buy organic food, as it becomes probably more financially viable. The same way, there is going to be a, I think we're feeling an uptick in many places of attendance going up for certain kinds of live entertainment. So at, that has that palpable sense that it, you can't get through technology. There was a question here, yes sir. I'm pressing the mic. I'm a composer and actually former chorus master of Washington Opera. Uh huh. Good. Nice to meet before you. Before it became national. Hi. Uh, I see. I note note that you are a, a, an incredible linguist, and uh, I would like to know your have your take on something that bothers me about updating operas that. Uh, it seems to me a disconnect if you, if you place a, a 19th century opera in Italian or German or Russian in contemporary world. It, it works very nicely as theater, but the language, unless it's sung in English or in the, the language of the people 
that, that it's being performed for, which is why I think the updating works better in Europe where people are more fluent in languages. I'd like to, to know your, your take on that because, I mean, for instance, you can set Don Giovanni in a McDonald's in Hanoi, uh, but if you sing it in Italian, it doesn't, doesn't make much sense to me. Well, I, you know, you're asking a question that's sort of one of the age-old discussions of the last 20 years, really, of, of uh, what about contemporizing productions? And, and I think, you know, it's the same answer that we always give, which is that, you know, language is, language is, language is language. And whether you choose to make it sort of that you focus totally on the words as opposing to the music or the story, then there are always going to be people who don't necessarily agree with it, which is, I can see you're in that camp rather strongly. Well, yeah. Well, I think there's a disconnect about a lot of things. And I mean, we accept that Picasso painted a guitar that doesn't look like a guitar, but we accept that. So I think it's, it's, it's in that we accept the Impressionists. We accept everything about, about art that doesn't really look like it. So I guess I, I put all these things in the same basket. So I don't want to say I, I disagree with you. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to, is that I think it's all about interpretation and that as a theater practitioner, we all have the right to interpret things a certain way. And so I think that you're, you're being literal, and I respect that you're literal. Yeah, I got it. You like 19th century realistic paintings, I imagine, more than you like contemporary art. Well, right. No, but, it, but they're related, these things. It's, ex it's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's about how you interpret what you see and hear, and that's a choice, I think, as, a, as how someone does it. I mean. Yeah, we can change the supertitle, we can, we can do all sorts of things. But language, I think, is something, again, that can be interpreted in different ways. I mean, when, when Brunhilde says, bring me my horse, all right, does it have to be a horse? Or does it have to be something that is spiritually transporting her to her next life? And those are the questions that I think you ask, that I ask as I, as I work on things. And you either go with it or you don't. So I haven't sold you yet, but we'll keep working. <laughs> okay. I think it relates to uh, the idea of, of uh, what you refer to as you know making things more accessible and not dumbing them down, yeah. slightly. I mean, it depends on how you look at it, but there's a lot of controversy over the, the current Porgy and Bess that uh, Steve Sondheim wrote in right. strongly about. Uh, I think the controversy about that is the fact that they're billing it as Gershwin. It's not Gershwin's. I think that's where the difference is, is that I, you know, if they chose to do that, that's fine, but George Gershwin didn't write that, so you shouldn't be selling it as George Gershwin's. He didn't write those orchestrations. That's where I, th and that's Stephen Sondheim, and he's right. Yep. So, but that, about that I agree. Thomas, you like that? I'm defending the composer. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, I'm always interested in serving the composer's intentions. I mean, you know that every one of those composers wants to be accepted today if they were awake in their graves. Yes, ma'am. Meryl? Yes. Um, oh, okay. Yes, I'm, I'm interested in what you were saying. Um, I, I did, uh, for my sins, about 10 years writing about musical theater. Mm -hmm. I started from Leonard Bernstein and wrote a biography, and then I went on to Stephen Sondheim, wrote a biography, and then I finished with Richard Rogers, and I thought I've had enough of talking about West Side Story three different ways. But, but to get back to, to Sondheim, Sondheim's a very interesting figure. I was with him one time. This is a, by way of illustrating one of your points. I was with him one time at a rehearsal, we, he was uh, doing a, they were doing a production of Company, and uh, at a certain moment, uh, the director had introduced a dance, and he said to me, come on, let's go over here and have a look, they're going to do a dance to this song, and I said, Steve, I don't remember a dance to this song. He said, no, there's never been a dance to this song, they're going to do one. And I said, how do you feel about that? And he said, it makes my stomach turn over. And I said, Steve, you're the composer. Why don't you tell them it makes your stomach turn over? And he says, no, no, can't do that, he says. They have to find it out for themselves. I thought that was a very nice way of illustrating your point. Well, I, I think, I mean, having, I've worked with many living composers and writers, and, 
and some of them want it to the T, exactly what's on the page, and other people like Philip Glass say, I don't know what I wrote, you figure it out. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we know that, that, again, the person who created it is, that's why I say we're the interpreters, and some people want it to the letter, and some living people are like, I'm giving it to you to figure out what is it that you are going to do with it. Thank you for coming, uh, this is very interesting. Tell me, I know we talked a lot about uh, programs for children and all that. Do you worry about the graying of the audience or do you think this is a perennial worry? I think that there was graying of the audience in the court 200, 300 years ago. I think that the Medici's, you can't imagine that the Medici's, who are really what I consider the first patrons, were out there saying, are we interesting children enough in Monteverdi, do you think? Um, I, I, I think that part of the graying of the audience comes with the, the sophistication of understanding and appreciating art. And as I said, I, I, I'm happy that the graying of the audience hopefully is a new audience because there are so many people and I think it's, we've all experienced that of bringing someone to an exhibit or an institution or a performance and, and realizing that you have opened their eyes up to something. So also, th who has money? Those are the people who have money. Those are our those are our donors. It's not like many twenty two year olds are sending me in much more than you know. I'm lucky if they're sending me a hundred dollars. So I take it that that's a no. That's a no, <laughs> Kenneth. That's a no. No, I wor I worry about just getting bums on seats. And whoever's on the and and I do think that again, it's it's our society is aging, and but also our society is is working less. So it's like, who am I going to get in the audience? I think that the, the economic factor can't be underestimated, though. I mean, if you think about how the prices have escalated on Broadway, for instance, from that side, leave aside the opera, just Broadway in general, just on a ratio basis, it's really grown. Well, Usually I mean, that, I think it. that would be a discussion for the Aspen Institute to take up unions versus art. And that is the discussion that has to happen, that has to happen very realistically and very honestly and very openly. Because that is what, what has driven up cost. It's not the performers. Most people are paid less than they were a decade ago, who, and as are many union members as well. But so that is really the cost factor. And I think that that is something that really has to be explored. I'm looking at somebody here from the NEA. This is Georgiana Paul over here. And I'm thinking that is a discussion that we just don't seem to be having. Nobody wants to talk about it. No, it's, a really, it's a really dicey one when you look at the, the contract issues that have gone on, let's say, in Detroit, the symphony, right. or things that have gone on just now with City right. Opera, you mentioned. Yeah, That's I'm a, a member of four unions. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, there's both sides. But I do think that it is an important part of if the arts are going to survive, there has to be, there has to be a kind of give and take that we haven't found yet a balance, and there also has to be reinventing what some of these arts are. You know, I mean, again, when I talk about a 19th century art form, it still takes the same number of people to play Swan Lake, Tchaikovsky, and Wagner that it did 120 years ago that it does now. So should we be rethinking how we hear those things? Should we be using virtual orchestras? Can't, you know, all of these things are part of if we want those pieces to survive, what is it that's gonna make them survive? Absolutely. Peggy, did you want to? Oh, first of all, let me just say what a delight it is to have you here, Jessica. It's Thank really, you. really, really great. And I've had the great pleasure of talking with both Jessica and Damien about their work in China. And um, both of you talked about it as being a really moving experience. In particular, you know, the cultural challenges there. And Damien, uh, you described being on the stage with Yo-Yo Ma and what was happening at the time. And I'm struck by both of you talking about the usefulness and the reach of your work. So I wonder if you could tell us about some really headliner moments when you were in China that amplified what you're really both trying to do in your lives right now. Uh, well, I, I think one of the fortunate things about working in the theater is uh, I'm sure you've experienced this, is that I've been everywhere in the world. I haven't not worked anywhere. I, 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 I have, I've been, like Iceland, I made my professional debut, okay? All right, <laughs> the National Theater of Iceland in Reykjavik, rinky dink, I used to call it. Um, I, 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 so I feel that I have been so many places and been very fortunate. Um, China was an eye-opening experience. I, I'll just, I'll quickly tell two uh, stories about it. 
The first was I went to the National Center for the Performing Arts in Beijing, the new building that looks like the egg. It's called the egg. And the first day when I went there, I brought set designs, which is what, as a director, you bring the designs, your visual concept, how you're going to do it. It was Carmen. It's very traditional. You would have been very happy. Uh, and, but, but it was a huge set. Like, we never would make a set that big in America because we could never afford it. But everybody told me, make a lot for China. They want a lot. They want it realistic. So we made it very realistic. And uh, we had a wall that we said, well, we could use that wall in the second act and the third act. And the guy was, there was like a lot of talking, a lot of talking for like a minute. I was like, oh, and they were all upset. And then finally the translator said to me, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Everything has to be different and new for every act. And I said, well, well it's going to cost like 20 more people. To, and the guy looked at me and he said, this is China. We have nothing but people. Um, and, and so as it turned out, we had a, a, a crew, a scenic crew, of about 150 people, which you could never in America, you know, you're constantly trying to cut it down. So that was China, sort of the funny side. And then shortly thereafter, I went to work in Cambodia, which actually I think was in a way much more moving. Uh, I was there working with uh, a friend of mine named Fred Frumberg, who you should have come speak here, who's been living there for 10 years, working to bring back the uh, original arts of Cambodia in dance and music. And so I worked with a group of women. He wanted me to come and work with uh, a group of actresses who all wanted to direct, to help them learn how to direct. And so I said, well, I think that you know, we need to create a story for you to direct. I can't like bring you, you know, our town and we direct that. So we wrote a play while we were there. And what was very, very moving to me was they all told stories of, of losing family members and of uh, being sexually brutalized uh, all in their childhood. And uh, one of them had been a prostitute before she became an actress to get money for her family. And so we wrote a play about that. And then they performed it. And that was probably one of the most moving. And I, I mean, how could I teach them how to direct their life story? But I said, well, this is you know, how you put the story together and how you can able to create it over and over and over, which is what theater is. And that was certainly one of my greatest, greatest theatrical experiences. Well, I'll just follow you with the, a, another National Performing Arts Center story. This was what Peggy referred to as last fall. It's part of what's called the U.S.-China Forum on Arts and Culture, which was a collaboration between the Aspen Institute Arts Program and the Asia Society and a Chinese entity called uh, the Friendship Association. And uh, among the, con there was conversations about how arts and culture can be shared between the societies and who's filmmakers and lots of distinguished artists uh, from our side of America. We brought uh, Yo-Yo Ma, as you mentioned, and Meryl Streep, and Joel Cohen, and uh, Eric Fischel, and it was a real uh, array of people. And uh, Alice Waters was cooking at the embassy. But the capper was meant to be a performance that was a collaboration of some kind. And that's where I had diametrically different experiences. Because first of all, we were in the concert hall. And which their ex expectation was that Yo-Yo would give, would play Bach, essentially. They right. thought, this will be great. And then we'll have our distinguished chin player play the chin. And that's collaboration. But what Yo-Yo and I decided we really were going to have interactive things go on, including dancing and actual unusual things. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you can't do that in the concert hall. And it immediately turned into a negotiation on various levels, and by the time the actual day of the performance, literally I was begging for people actually to come and move things around. Oh. But then, and we had dancing not only on the stage, but in the, in the audience as well. But the capper was, we learned about each other. That was the point. And we, we got to a place where we actually understood through the, that we were talking about risk. We were taking a risk. And I realized midway through what a risk it was for them. They thought, this is, this is too scary for us. To, we could embarrass ourselves if we this is not you know, normal, if it's not controlled. And the real uh, kind of button on the whole thing was that Meryl and Yo-Yo did a, a, a spoken word uh, performance that I arranged where she uh, read a, a Tang Dynasty poem. He played George Crumb. Uh, and then she read the famous letter from uh, Martha Graham to Agnes DeMille about individuality. And that's kind of scooted under the wire, uh, if you will, a little bit in terms of the message there about individuality. But that's, that was all beautiful, as you can imagine, and amazing. But then she proceeded to go off script. And in the bows, she bowed to Yo-Yo, he bowed to her. And she proceeded to lay flat on the stage in front of Yo-Yo and prostrate herself to him. And then he laid flat on the stage holding his cello. And the Chinese just couldn't actually imagine what 
you know, the, the levels right. that people would go to beyond decorum, beyond, right. you know, all of that. So that's what, I mean, I thought it was just, you never, I, I didn't know that was coming, what to say. Who was in the audience? A uh, mixture, huge mixture of people, of uh, invited audiences from all the organizations, <coughs> students, uh, it was 2,000 people, and it's, uh, it was crazy. And they all danced, Sarah and I. Sarah and I. It's great. Uh, Please. Should we wrap it up? Yes, we should. Yeah. Uh, last words for Jessica? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's just a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And I'm happy to be here for questions afterwards. And thank you, everyone, I know, for coming out in the middle of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.